Hi, uh, my name is Tim Hunt. I'm a biochemist and uh, I'm here to answer some very excellent questions that have been put by a bunch of uh, school children. Megan, who is aged 11 and comes from London, wants to know how long until there's a cure for cancer. Well, the answer is that some cancers can already be cured, but unfortunately not as many as we'd like. Uh, for example, my mother-in-law had a huge tumor in her head, in here, in the, si the size of a grapefruit it was, and um, once they saw it by means of this uh, MRI imaging, um, it wasn't that hard for the surgeon to cut it out, and 10 years later, at the age of 93, she's still going strong. Um, other ones are a little trickier to deal with and, um, uh, the, you know, there's, there's an awful long way to go before we can say that uh, we can cure all cancers. Carr, I don't know how old Carr is or where he or she comes from because it doesn't say. It's an interesting question, this. Is there something that controls the organelles of the cell? like a nucleus in the mitochondrion, or nucleus. If there is, is there an infinite number of nuclei within organelles and beyond? And the answer is that, uh, of course, the nucleus is where the chromosomes and the DNA, most of the DNA in the cell is, but the mitochondria also have a genome, and the two genomes talk to one another. Now, I don't think it's terribly well understood exactly how they talk, what they're saying to one another, but somehow cells know how many mitochondria they ought to have inside them. So that's a really interesting question, and I hope maybe Carr will, uh, when they get their PhD, will work on this. So 12-year-old uh, Sophie, who comes from Croydon, asks, is it right to genetically modify humans? I think it depends, really, on who's doing the modification. If you think about it, Every time you catch a cold or some other virus disease, the virus genetically modifies your cells, and that's not much fun. And probably the worst of those, a well-known example, is the uh, AIDS virus, HIV, which actually gets into the genome and modifies and kills uh, cells of the immune system. So that's not at all good. On the other hand, um, if you uh, had the bad luck to suffer from a genetic disease, it might be a very good thing to be able to give you back a good copy of that gene, which can, in some simple and favorable cases, already be done. And uh, this is something which I think needs a lot more work on so that we can really do it reliably. And there is one other little problem if you think about it. Um, it's not that easy, even with a virus, to deliver the gene to every single one of your cells. So that's a big problem and again something that people are working on now and we'll probably have to go on working on for quite a good long time. So as with all these questions it, it, you know, it, it can be good, it can be bad. So Mia, who's 10 years old and comes from London, says have you ever done an experiment that's taken over a year to get right? And the answer is that in my line of country, the, the experiments usually don't take that long, but getting ready to do the experiments does take lo that long. And the longest one I can think of was about a five-year gap between planning the experiment and actually being able to, to, to carry it out because uh, we had to develop the tools that were necessary to do it. But when we did it, it was a very good experiment. The 14-year-old Ellie from Essex says, should politicians listen to scientists more than they do currently, especially regarding saving the planet for the continuation of mankind? Well, that's a really hard question, and I think it's really important to take a, what's called these days an evidence-based look at the issues which confront us. But it's pretty hard to find scientists, actually, who will agree on uh, what to best to do to save the planet, and some wouldn't even agree that the planet need saving. So I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure. I think there's one nice example that I can think of which shows you that you may not trust the politicians, but it's maybe not so wise to trust the scientists either. I can think of one really good example of this which I found uh, recently. It's, it comes from a long time ago, but there was a famous scientist who was uh, Charles Darwin's great friend and champion. And he was asked about uh, 
whether we weren't taking too many fish out of the ocean. And this great expert scientist said, absolutely no problem at all. You know, we'll never ever run out of fish. So here, there's an example, a very famous scientist who was just wrong about something. So scientists can be wrong as well as politicians. And I think it, you know, we need give and take on both, both sides to try and get these things right. Ian uh, asks, if you had 50 billion pounds, where would you like to best spend it on? Searching space or searching the seas? Well, that's a tough one because uh, the Space Telescope, for example, I think is a wonderful thing and has allowed us to, or allowed astronomers to see much, much more clearly into the heavens. So I find that very romantic and wonderful. And um, on the other hand, you know, searching the seas is much closer to home and maybe could produce some great benefits for mankind in terms of even things, important things like understanding climate change because there are a lot of photosynthetic organisms in the seas which uh, fix CO2 and therefore really directly affect the, the, the climate. And I don't think we know nearly enough about these, these creatures or how they interact uh, with each other and with the creatures like ourselves who live on land. So an interesting question, you know. Interesting question. So I thought those were some really uh, terrific questions and if um, you like the answers then um, why don't you enter for the National Science and Engineering Competition? <laughs>